Notice the cross adorns the sanctuary this morning, a reminder that we have begun the season of Lent. Lent is a 40-day period of time excluding Sundays that leads us in the journey towards Easter. It began on this past Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. It's a time of reflection and penitence for us, a time for inner examination, a time to take stock of where we are in our life and ask ourselves the question, Am I walking in such a way that others would see Jesus living in me? And so Lent is a powerful journey leading us to that cross moment and to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's a great time for us to be focused on who he is and what what he has done for us. In this Lenten season, we are going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture each of the weeks. Many hundreds of years ago, the Christian church gathered and they set aside a program of scripture reading and on a daily basis that's called the Common Lectionary. And the lectionary is done for daily scripture reading purposes. And there's always an Old Testament, a New Testament, a psalm, and an epistle lesson for every day of the year. We don't always follow that. And we are going to look at at least two passages of scripture because Old and New Testament are related. It is not one is the old and the new is something different. These are interconnected. This is a part of God's story to us. And so today we're reading in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3 and then in Matthew chapter 4. So follow along as we read God's Word together. If you've not brought your Bible, you should. But if you've not brought it today, there is a Bible in front of you in the pew, and I'd encourage you to use that as we read God's Word. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of life, I'm sorry, not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And then chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then turn with me back to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, and reading there verses 1 through 11. This Matthew passage, as you're turning, is the passage that immediately follows the baptism story of Jesus. Jesus has gone to John to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. And the voice from heaven comes, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And immediately following the baptism of Jesus, he goes up onto the mountain and he is there tempted uh, for some 40 days and 40 nights. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. Today I want to speak to you about the topic, when temptation comes. It's not the topic, if temptation comes. If is not the issue. It's when. Temptation has been a part of man's journey and man's life from the beginning. God creates Adam, puts him in the Garden of Eden, all the other animals, all the trees, all that kind of thing. He is alone and God causes him to fall into a sleep, takes a rib from it, creates the woman to be a helpmate. And they are in the garden and they have pretty much free reign. They are allowed to eat from any of the trees in the garden with the exception of one. It's the tree right in the middle. You know, God has always intended us to have a certain measure of stress in our lives. He doesn't put that tree on the edge of the garden where they don't have to see it. He puts it in the middle where they're going to encounter it on a regular daily basis. And the Lord God says, you may eat of any tree except this one. For if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. No problem. We have all this other stuff. We can eat from all these other things. Right? And the serpent comes along. And the serpent says to the woman, did God say you're not allowed to eat from any of these trees? See the corruption of that statement? The twisting of that truth? And by the way, anytime truth is twisted, it is no longer true. Didn't God say you're not allowed to eat any of this? And she said, no, God said we're allowed to eat of all of it except this one. And then she even adds a little to that. If you eat of it or touch it, you will surely die. And the serpent says, you won't die. Surely you won't die. What will happen is you'll gain knowledge. You'll gain wisdom. You'll gain understanding. It is called the tree of knowledge. And she looks at it. And it looks really, really good to her. And the fruit was desirable to her. And so she takes some of it. She eats it. And she gives some to her husband. And he eats it too. And immediately they realize they are naked. I'm glad you're not naked. You know, when I was in college and took speech classes, they used to say, just picture the audience in their underwear. No thanks. I'm also glad I'm not naked. It's an uncomfortable feeling. You know, babies are cute when they're naked. The rest of us are just naked when we're naked. We don't like that. We're uncomfortable with that. They were naked and realized. You know, when we are clothed, we can hide things. 
I wear a lot of black. They say black makes you look thinner. Don't believe everything they say. But you don't know what I have underneath my jacket here today. I don't have anything dangerous except my cell phone. And I don't normally do that except in this circumstance with Melinda. But you know, somebody can hide something. But when you're naked, there's no hiding. Innocency is gone. Now why, with all those trees, and all of the fruit, and all of the leaves, and all of that kind of thing, would you fixate yourself on the one thing that you cannot? I almost did an experiment this morning, and then I thought, nah. If I'd have had the children here this morning, I'd have probably done this. The latter wasn't enough last week. By the way, I didn't check the weight rating on the ladder either, but it did hold. But I had a little doubt in my mind when I got about two-thirds of the way up the ladder, is this really a good idea? Thank the Lord, he forgives my stupidity sometimes. The thing I would have done with the children this morning, except some of them aren't old enough yet to read, but I should have done it with you, is put a sign out on the hallway wall that said, wet paint. Do you know what people do when something says wet paint? To see if it really is wet. Now, is that really what you want to do with wet paint? You want to put your finger in? Then what do you do? And then you get out your handkerchief and say, okay, uh, or you walk up to your brother and you pat him on the back. We are tempted. Temptation is a part of what we deal with. It's not a matter of if temptation comes for us. It's a matter of when temptation comes. What do you do? Scripture says resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. It doesn't say invite him in. It says resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So then we move to that New Testament passage, that wonderful story of Jesus. He's just been baptized out in the Jordan River. John, his cousin, has baptized him. He has proclaimed him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has announced his coming. He is the forerunner of Jesus. He is the last in that series of prophets who has proclaimed the word and is preparing the, the soil for the reception of the gospel. He has prepared the way for Jesus to come. He has announced him as coming. And Jesus is baptized. The voice of heaven speaks audibly. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And immediately after that, the Spirit of God leads Jesus up onto the mountain in the desert. And he's there for 40 days and 40 nights with no food or water. And the scripture says, just so innocently, he was hungry. I'm not good in a grocery store. First of all, I walk the grocery store six or seven times to find the one thing that I'm looking for. I become fixated on the one thing that I'm looking for, and I'm going to find it before I go to the next thing that I'm looking for. Melinda's much better in the grocery store because she's done that so many times. But recently I've had to go to the grocery store. Well, actually, for the last two weeks I could say, Sarah, here's the giant card. Go to the grocery store. There are things in the grocery store that are of temptation to me. And I'm not real good at steering that cart away from them. The ice cream aisle being one of those places. 
I rationalize. It has good stuff in it. Milk, eggs, milk, eggs. Got to be good for you. A number of years ago, I was in the grocery store, and I had a beeper back then. Remember the days before you had a cell phone, you had a beeper? Had a beeper, and I'm in the grocery store, I have my cart, and I'm, I'm, I'm in the ice cream aisle, and I'm looking for my favorite ice cream. By the way, it's vanilla. My life's so exciting, I have to have something that just keeps it calm for me, and so it's vanilla. I'm looking for my vanilla ice cream, and suddenly my beeper goes off, and this kid said, Look out, Mom, he's backing up! Should have been a sign. <laughs> Temptation. Temptation for us comes about in, in multiple ways, and I think the temptations of Jesus paint that picture for us. It's not just a physical temptation for Jesus. It is that. Jesus is there, and Satan comes to him and says, Tell these stones to become bread. Now, I want you to understand, turning stones into bread would be a good thing. I mean, you could feed a lot of people if you could turn stones into bread. And Jesus certainly can turn stones into bread. But the issue is this. Is that a good thing or the best thing? You and I are not so much tempted as the choice between that which is evil and that which is good. You and I are pretty good at discriminating and say, well, that's evil. We don't want any part of that. But I don't think you and I are nearly so good at discriminating between that which is good and that which is best. Turn those stones into bread. And Jesus said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is something better than bread. Now, I don't know. I like bread. When I'm out there on 83 and you go around that big curve and the wholesome plant is there and they're baking bread, aren't you immediately hungry? Couldn't you just imagine a slice of warm bread with a little butter or a lot? on it. There is physical testing for us. Then the next test of Jesus is Satan takes him up onto the high place on the temple and says, throw yourself down. Now listen to this. Because the Bible says he will send his angels to guard you in all of your ways. The Satan is quoting scripture. Yeah, guess what? He knows it. But scripture misapplied is wrong. Jesus looks at him and says, scripture also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. What is it that tempts you and I? When we stand on the hill of our life and we look out at all of the things and some, something catches our eye, something that glimmers or glistens, something that becomes the most important thing for us at that moment, perhaps a material possession, Perhaps it's the new car or the new house or the new job. It's the principle of never being satisfied. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned to be content in all situations, whether rich or poor, whether in plenty or in want, whether well-fed 
or or hungry. Temptations. Now I do have a few questions about food. There's just some things I wonder about. You know, my, my mind just never really shuts down. And I wonder about things. You know, for instance, that rhubarb, the leaves are poisonous, and the stems are edible. Does that make any sense? So six guys are there one day, and six of them eat some of the leaves, and the other, and six other guys are watching that, and these guys don't do well after eating the leaves. And so the other six say, I tell you what, tomorrow we're going to try the stems. Really? You've tried the leaves and you've gotten sick on them? Hey, let's try the stems. I mean, come on. Some things about food that attract us that aren't good. Years and years and years ago, I used to be a smoker. And when I was in college, I decided I, was, I, I needed to quit smoking. I mean, no one wants their pastor smoke. Okay? So I designed a program to quit smoking, and I was successful in doing that. And I want to tell you, quitting smoking is a breeze in comparison to learning to eat right. I mean, you can look at me and realize I don't eat right. Because with smoking, you never have to smoke again. You can finally get to the point where you can quit, and you never have to light up another cigarette, cigar, whatever it might be, pipe. Even the smokeless tobaccos. You never have to do that again. But learning to eat right is a challenge because you have to still eat. The difference between good and best is where the challenge comes. And then there's the third temptation. takes him unto the high mountain. Satan takes Jesus unto the high mountain, shows him all of the kingdoms of the world. Now, most of us don't even want to think about the fact that Satan controls all this, but he does. Scripture tells us that very early on. Remember the story of Job? One day, God is in his throne room, and Satan appears before him. And he says to him, Satan, where have you been? I've been wandering to and fro over the face of the earth. Satan is in charge of this, for now. He shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. offers him the opportunity to bow down. And Jesus does not. What are we willing to throw down for a few moments? Temptation comes to us physically, spiritually, Emotional. None of us who have ever asked Jesus to be our Savior and Lord have decided, well, today I'm just going to put God in a box and I'm going to live for Mike. We don't think about that way. But we do. Well, I know I should read my Bible today, but I'm really busy.
God gets moved aside. And we focus on that which is good rather than that which is best. Joshua tells us, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Keep your eye fixed on the Lord and all the other things will fall into place. When I was a kid growing up in the 1960s, I, I've been a sports fan all of my life and I enjoyed watching a running back who played for the Chicago Bears. His name was Gail Sayers. He had a wonderful story, a wonderful career, but it was made possible because of the people who would block for him, including a guy named Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo died with cancer. Gail Sarris wrote the story, which then became a movie. Brian saw. And it was in watching Brian Piccolo that Gail Sayers learned the important lessons of life. And that's to have the correct priority. The Lord is first. Did you hear that? The Lord is first. My family is second. I am third. Do you imagine how that would revolutionize our life and our society if we could adopt that priority? The Lord is first, my family is second, and I am third. I'm going to confess something to you at this moment. Something that happened to me a long, long time ago. While I was in ministry, I got my priorities confused. I was working 12, 14, 16 hours a day, some days. Working on my doctorate degree at the same time spending very little time with my family and even less time in my devotional life with God. Here I am a pastor. Here I am pastoring a church. Here I am studying for my doctorate degree so I can serve the Lord better. And I'm ignoring my devotional life and I'm ignoring my family. It's wrong. God never asked me or anybody else to sacrifice their family at the altar of the church. The Lord is first. My family is second. I am third. I got that priority out of whack. And Melinda lovingly and patiently Prayed for me and loved me until I came to my senses. I never had an adulterous relationship with somebody. That's not the confession I'm making to you this morning. I never did those kinds of things, but I put other things ahead of the Lord and, and myself ahead of my family. When temptation comes, if you have the Lord first in your life, your family second in your life, and you come next, you will be able, by the Lord's help, to overcome whatever temptation there is.
whether it's physical, spiritual, or emotional. Because Satan will attack you in places that you don't even know about. And he's subtle. Doesn't that tree look good? Don't its fruit look delicious? Surely you won't die. Surely your eyes will just be open. Surely it'll be good. good. When temptation comes, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. so that you and I might live. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we know that daily we have temptations in our life. Temptations to choose that which is good rather than that which is best. Help us to keep our eye fixed on you. Help us to choose this day whom we will serve. Help us to be strong in our faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we go out into a world that deals with temptation and strife, help us to be examples of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he offers, and the life that he bestows. Help us to go into a world of darkness and bear the light of Christ. In Jesus we pray. Amen.